Uh, good. Can you this meeting is being recorded. Yes, you can. <laughs> okay, awesome, everyone. So today I'm going to be talking about working with open source computer vision code bases. And we're going to be going through sort of some of the ways that we think about when we do want to look for other people's code, when we might just want to build something from scratch, what the pros and cons are for both of those things. And then we're going to do an interactive activity where we try to navigate an open source code base altogether. Um, so when should you adapt open source code? Seems like a reasonable question. Um, essentially, there are a lot of things, and you know, like Benny showed yesterday, this is a screenshot from his presentation, that are built in. Um, there's a lot of built-in options for simple models. Um, for example, here you can see this is just like straightforward PyTorch code. And you can see here, you just say model equals unit, right? That unit is something you've imported from PyTorch. It already exists. Um, maybe you're doing some pretty standard like task. There are a lot of things that are built in. And if you're doing something like classification, for example, um, it can actually sometimes just be a lot easier to use these innate built-in PyTorch things. Um, so what is built into PyTorch? Um, what things are already in here? So if you want to look at like what stuff is just already in PyTorch, you can actually just go to torchvision.models. There's a documentation page. I've linked it in the slides. But essentially, you can just go, and they will explicitly tell you what's available. Um, and actually, you can see on the side, yes, there's classification, but there's also semantic segmentation, which is often things like what the remote sensing um, people in this room might be looking at, um, and object detection, instance segmentation, person key point detection, and even video classification are all things that some of those models are built in. Um, and actually, particularly for classification, there's a lot of options, right? And, and there's a lot of trade-offs between these different types of options, and we can definitely talk to you about which type you might want to use. But if you're doing a classification problem, um, I might actually say that you'd be better off just working from Benny's great, super simple example um, and adapting it yourself. But what if you want to do something like object detection or instant segmentation? So these are the options for object detection built into PyTorch. There's faster RCNN and there's mask RCNN. Um, which is more of like a segmentation model. So not very many options. And um, they're also faster RCNN and mask RCNN are also can be quite big, quite hefty. And in recent developments, there's been a lot of object detection models that have been developed to get the same performance as these, but are lighter weights. I mean, slower, faster training time, faster inference time, kind of nice. So what if we want to use a different model? What if we want to use something that's not already built into PyTorch? GitHub. <laughs> Um, there is just this amazing tool where everyone can put their code on the internet and anyone else can use it. Um, so if we're like, okay, we want to do object detection and we search object detection in GitHub, there are 35, 36,000 repositories, right? Um, open source repositories have a lot of pros and cons and there's tons of options. The nice thing, and I think maybe the most important thing about some of these open source repositories and honestly, even if you wanted to train a faster RCNN model with a ResNet backbone, you might still want to use an open source repository because they might have more built-in tools than the vanilla PyTorch implementation. These can be things like fancy loss functions, evaluation. So um, code for explicitly evaluating using like a Cocoa format and generating things like mean average precision, which is an evaluation metric that Eli will talk about next week that can be a total pain in the ass to get right. And I have implemented my own version of um, mean average position many times with bugs in it. So um, using other people's code can help you just avoid writing a lot of your own code. Um, and that's the other good thing. If you have a repository that's really widely used, a lot of people have used it. That means there's been this opportunity for other people to find and fix the bugs. So you can actually, usually with some of these really well vetted implementations, you can trust them to not have bugs in them that are going to like have these insidious effects on your model. Whereas sometimes if someone writes a paper and they push the code for that paper and it's brand new, 
unfortunately, there's a high likelihood that there's probably some mistakes in there. It's just really easy to make mistakes when you're when you're building this stuff. The risks are you need to be able to then read and understand someone else's code, which can be super hard. I'm sure you've all dealt with that even in R when you like get someone else's code package and you're like, this thing should work. I know it should, but what the heck do I do? Um, it's not always well documented. And this is one of the reasons that we've been pushing you guys to document your work, both in your written assignments, but then as you build out your GitHub repositories, we'll be pushing you to also document your GitHub code so that you and others can understand what the code does and you know how to actually use it. And sometimes these can be heavier weight than you need. Um, because these repositories are sometimes trying to do lots of things, they're very productionized. And so what that can mean is they, it, can, it can actually be harder to navigate because it's not just like Benny's nice clean code base where it's like, here's train, here's eval, here's the data loader. There might be 27 data loaders for different types of data. There might be, um, you know, they might support something like 40 different backbones and then you have to figure out where those backbones are defined. Um, so the fancier code bases can be harder to navigate, but of course then they also tend to be better vetted they tend to be more flexible. So it's kind of worth the investment sometimes to learn how to navigate a code base that you think you might lose, use a lot. So how do we know what code is good? Out of these like 36,599 repositories, um, how do you know whether it's something that you can trust? Um, so say we've like read the retina net paper, which is a lighter rate weight object detection model. And we wanna try retina net um, on, our, on our code or on our data. So if you Google RetinaNet, there's still 899 <laughs> repository results. That's still a lot of different people who are trying to use RetinaNet. And some of these people have completely implemented their own versions of RetinaNet. The first example here is actually in Keras, which is built on top of TensorFlow, and all of you have been working with PyTorch. The second one is PyTorch RetinaNet. Okay, but how do we go through, how do we decide where we wanna start? So yeah, still a lot of options. Things you wanna watch out for is as you start looking in, you, I would strongly recommend, if you can avoid it, um, trying to work with any code bases that don't have documentation. If the readme file on their GitHub says, read me the code for this paper link to paper with no information about you know, anything, it's probably also not documented anywhere else very well. And it's going to be really confusing, especially for someone who's new to PyTorch to try to figure out what to do with it. If their data is hard coded into their repo, like if you go to try and figure out how to use your data and you realize that they basically built everything in, it's not like modular, it's gonna, there's all these places inside the code that are like relying on their data in ways that you're gonna have to change in a, like every single place. Stuff like that, one, hard to actually figure They didn't have good coding practices and other things that they were doing. Um, this third one is like, it's a little bit like being a lemming. If I see a repository and like nobody started it and nobody's forked the repository, it basically looks like no one else besides the people who published the code have ever used it. That's again a red flag because it's like, ah, uh, I'm going to be the guinea pig. And if I could avoid being the guinea pig, that would be preferable. Um, and if they don't have any pre-trained models available for their code base, because then that would mean if you guys wanted to use that code, but you, you maybe have less data and you want to be able to start from something pre-trained on, let's say, ImageNet, then you would have to use that code, train it on ImageNet yourself, figure out how to get a good ImageNet model with the code, and then use that ImageNet model and then fine tune it with your data. And it's definitely going to just speed you up quite a bit if you can just um, directly import weights from something that's pre-trained on the ImageNet. Um, so from, with that said, um, definitely there are different implementations and different types of models where you might want, you might end up using a one-off code base that only does one model. There are also a ton of very well-established repositories that are maintained by companies <laughs> and these companies or teams of people um, are then, you know, putting a lot of time and effort into not just like 
initially deploying the code, but actually maintaining it. So updating when things go to new versions, um, handling the fact that uh, maybe like some layer gets deprecated and you need to replace it with a different version of that layer. And then you need to retrain your, your uh, sort of off the shelf pre-trained ImageNet models and provide those again. And like just that type of maintenance. Um, these code bases and, and many others as well uh, tend to have that in there. Um, and so detect run two, I think Benny mentioned yesterday, run by Facebook. Um, the TensorFlow object detection API is the only TensorFlow one up here, but um, that's you know also well maintained, does object detection in TensorFlow. Torch Geo is actually quite new, um, mostly maintained by uh, some people at Microsoft, and it is explicitly trying to build in a lot of this functionality for remote sensing. Um, PyTorch Video is a nice example if you're trying to do video classification or video object detection or even tracking. There's a really nice repo that has a ton of pre-trained models and different implementations for segmentation. Um, these are just a few, but essentially you can sometimes find this type of thing on just straight up Google. If you try to Google like um, segmentation repository PyTorch, you might get something first and then it has 27,000 stars and you're like, okay, it seems like people are using this and it's pretty well established. So with that said, we're now gonna do what I'm calling a GitHub scavenger hunt. Um, and so what that's going to mean is we're going to have, uh, we're gonna take turns and either you're gonna volunteer or I'm just gonna start picking people. Um, and you're gonna come up here and you're gonna control the mouse. And then everyone in the room is gonna chip in. When we originally designed this, we were gonna have you pair up, but because of COVID, we want you to stay far apart from each other. Um, so this was our idea of how we could try to do this interactively, but still all stay spread out. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, um, but this is going to be tricky. And uh, I will say that sometimes you go down a rabbit hole in a code base, you like go all the way through something, you end up in some code and you're like, this isn't right. You have to go all the way back out again, try and figure out what other maybe like thread to go down. Um, it's going to be kind of back and forth. That's understood. There are some of you who have a little bit more familiar with PyTorch than others. Feel free to like try and help your friends. Um, but yeah, the idea is that we're doing this together. And if you don't figure it out right at first, that's totally fine. Um, so we're going to do this in the Detectron 2 code base. It's this code base that does a lot of different types of detection, segmentation, key point estimation, et cetera. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I have that code base pulled up. And then I also have this open uh, open source code scavenger hunt document and that's in the assignments folder on github so you can all go ahead and pull that up on your computer um, and then we'll go through those questions one by one and so do i have a volunteer to be the first one it's easy so if you where is the documentation is not so bad so if you want to be first and just do the easy one go for it all right francesca I saw your hand first Okay, and then um, on on Zoom, can you guys see this on my screen? Is yeah. it still sharing? Okay, yeah. you can see this is the Detectron code base? Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. I'm just gonna expand this window. All right, so go on up. I tried to go through the documentation on the Detectron 2 yesterday, and I didn't, oh. I didn't get very far, so. so there you go. This is try two. <laughs> um, cool. So, right, so where is the documentation? I would start with the readme file. Yeah, perfect. Well, um, cool. Okay, cool. So it's the same document. Mm -hmm. um, so cool video. I, I would look for if they have something around. Yeah, maybe getting started. Installation instructions are going to be important, but we're going to skip the installation stuff. This is okay. Navigating the code. Okay, awesome. Oh, okay. And they have a collab notebook. Great. Uh, <laughs> 
Okay. I don't know. I mean, looking at this, it looks pretty good to me, like in terms of like the first assessment. Um, yeah. Which obviously it's, it's a big, it's a big tool. Very So we want to train a, de a detection model. What are the options we have? And pick one. Wow, so much power. Okay, so we're here. Um, we need to find find a model. Inference demo with pre-trained models. Oh, I like pre-trained models. Um, where do you think we could maybe use find models? All, so anyone have any ideas on here where we might be able to find all the models that, like a list of all the models they support? Sure. So try okay. to use models. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm um, there. This is how to use models. Yeah, maybe if we go back to the GitHub. Uh, okay. License, sighting. Yeah. Model zoo. Oh, I like that. All right. Model zoo and baselines. Um, common cocoa models. So basically, they're just, I guess, calling all their models with wild animals and pushing them in a zoo. No, we don't want to put wild animals in a zoo, guys. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Oh, there's even more. Why are there so many? Yeah. Good question. So remember we said before we might be interested in retina nets. Oh, here it is. Let's pretend. Let's take retina nets. Well, there's three of them. A large shed. Anyone have any idea what the difference between those three models might be? This one's smaller. And it takes less time to train. I like that. Um. Wait, what's the difference between these two? Because of the number 50 and 101, particularly. And then it has an R. So I look at that and I immediately am like, ha, one of them is using a retina 50 backbone, like classification backbone, called classification backbone. What is this versus this? So it's LR sked, which to me that looks like learning rate sked. <laughs> Again. We're just going to the all this stuff. So the difference between those two things is going to be their learning rate together. And I would go with the simple one for that R50 with a learning rate schedule. But if the learning rate schedule is different, then why is the training time the same? It just the learning rate schedule is going to be if they're not doing more steps or less steps, it's oh. just changing how much how, they move. Uh, okay. Each step. Great. Yeah. Cool. So, um, okay. all right, so you found the model too. Awesome. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know the people on Zoom can't hear. I'm going to try and repeat it. Or Benny, do you want to come up and say what you're saying? Okay. Essentially, yeah, yeah, coming up. <laughs> Just a reminder for everyone that they can only hear you on Zoom if you're here. So we can try and repeat stuff. 
Yeah, sorry about that. Just a little bit of a completion on the learning rate scheduler. So like these two rows here, uh, as said, by default, you don't always keep the same learning rate during training, but once the model has learned something after some epochs, iterations of your data set, you can sometimes reduce the learning rate so that it starts to take smaller steps. And this helps it find really small optima and find read out some nitty gritty details you have in your data set. And what this means is the top one just has one learning rate all the way through training. And the middle row is exactly the same model. It's the same version 50. So it takes the same time in training and inference, same memory, but it's, its learning rate gets reduced twice over the course of training. And you see here, you also have metrics like here, this has, says box average precision in the bound box, probably not taking away too much. You see that this is slightly better. So this smaller learning rate during training helps the model converge to a bit of a better state. And which one works better for you? You have to figure it out. Depends on your data set. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so the next uh, thing we need to find is how we're going to specify what type of model we want to use when we train. So who's going to come up? Taiki. <laughs> So we, we know what model we want to use. We want to use that uh, that retina net, ResNet 50 with a single learning rate. How do we tell, how would we actually specify that we want to use that? Okay. Uh, Going to go back to their getting started. That seems useful. I would have guessed use models, but this seems very small and not like what I want. So I'm going to go back to getting started. Uh, so this says pick a model in its config file. So I need to find a YAML from our model zoo. This says it's a YAML. So I think if we just download this, then we should be able to point to, to that. It? Oh, I guess this that. probably should already be there. Hmm. Yeah, like if you're gonna if you're gonna run this, um, and, and it, he's basically there. So we said that he found that we needed a config file that was gonna be pointing to that model, right? And so then to train a model with so I guess if we've cloned this repo, then this folder just already exists for us. Oh, but mm -hmm. this was the model yeah. zoo. So that folder should already exist for you. So we should have this same configs. So we just need to find where find the one our Um, no, so it's not about downloading. Um, you you would have cloned this whole repository on GitHub. So you have all of this stuff on your computer. You don't really need to download anything necessarily, at least not at first. Um, but we're trying to figure out how, like where, where and how you would actually say, because there's so many options of models, how do you tell it what model you want to train? So, yeah, awesome. this file should exist because yep. we've cloned the whole repo. It's there, we did it. We did it, yay. And so you found that model and then where, how does that get specified during training? Uh, we need to tell it the config file when we want to train. And that's just in the command line. Yeah. Okay. Yay, Taiki. Yay. We did it. <laughs> All right. Do uh, I get to pick the next Yeah, you get you? to pick the, the next person. Ooh. Who is cowering and hiding? <laughs> okay, so the next one is we're going to figure out um, how we're going to need to adapt the code to use our own data. And what format does that code expect for detection input data? And then we're going to try and find a data set file that we want to know. Okay. So step one is 
how do we specify, how do we use custom data sets? This is getting harder. <laughs> um, how do we detect around the code base system right now? Here. So, um, I don't know, I'm stuck. How do we adapt this code to use our own data and what format does the code expect for detection? Input and remember, data. she's okay. not doing this by herself. She's chiming, <laughs> guys, help her out. <laughs> yeah, maybe go back to the documentation. Okay. Okay. So we're using a, a custom data set, right? Yeah. Okay. So, oops. Sorry, I made that into a new. How do you right click that? Yeah. Oh, it's on here. Okay, right. Thank you. So, what have I just? I just opened ah oh, a tutorial, which was we've actually opened this already. So, and this also has information. Are we doing pre-trained or on a custom data set? Uh, you want to use your own data, right? You okay. Want to train on your data. Okay. So I guess we use this code. So that's where you would put your data in, and then. So let's assume, no. like, so so you know, uh, the second question on here was, what format does the code base expect? Um, and so, anyway, okay. there, there, these things are intertwined, and there isn't, like, for this code base, there's not one answer. Okay. <laughs> so, it's saying, so the, 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 the example data set they use has only one class, mm -hmm. but they're saying that um, if you want to use a your data in the COCO format, you need to add these extra lines. So if we were using camera trap data in COCO format, we'd have to edit it for that, I guess. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, so, but yeah, we would basically define our data set with this kind of thing, I guess. Yeah, and um, so would that, where would that type of thing find that? See that little snippet of code? Um, where would you put that? You'd be in your data set script. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you'd want to make your own, right? Data set script. What they're telling you is the script can be quite simple, right? It just contains single definition of your data set. So here, my data set would be what your camera track data set. So what they're saying is, what, what, I'm, what I'm interpreting from this, is they have the commented lines at the top, right? If you pull up a little. Because if your data set's in the photo format, then you can do this with just three lines of code. So if you have that format of data, then it's already kind of built in. But then they also give an example of what you would need to do if your data's in a different format. Um, and then that, if you scroll down, or if you go to the default data set file, you can figure out what you would need to transfer it into to get a more specific data. And this is a really nice thing here in this demo. They have something that lets you verify that you got the right format, and you can visualize it and verify that you haven't, for example, switched your X and Y pixels in your box and gotten them. And that's something you can always do yourself. It's just looking at mm -hmm. the images with your data. So you can input your image. I guess in Coco format, it's like the image path and the box bounding box mm -hmm. coordinates. And then you can this visualizes it for you, yeah. puts the bounding box on the picture. But you're visualizing it from within their code. Right. Which means that now you know that within their code, it also understands your, your data. Okay.
Okay. Okay. Right. Cool. So the last thing you Sorry. need to do, Peggy, is you. I want you to find. Um, assume maybe you. You. Uh, so so if you do have something in cocoa format, do we want to pretend our data is in cocoa format? Sure. Okay. Easy. So in that case, it sounds like we don't actually really need to write a custom data loader or, or data set definition. All we have to do is register it and point to just those very simple, um, the JSON files essentially in our data definition. And then it knows how to read all that stuff in. Is the, the data loader is in the training file? Yes, we can use it. Or would you use it in the data set file? I can't remember. So I think the here, let's in. let's try to see, let's try to find where they define um, uh, a data set. And it might you might need to go back to the GitHub repo. Okay. So let's find where they define data sets. So any does this uh, anyone have any ideas for her? I'm trying to keep this interactive. <laughs> <laughs> Help her out. <laughs> so, you know, remember how yesterday Benny was showing you code and there was something that looked like dataset.py that then would like define, you know, mm -hmm. how to load a single image? Yeah. Um, so there will be something like that somewhere in this repo, and now we're trying to find them. Mm -hmm. And there are actually quite a few in this repo. They're all in one folder. So we're trying okay. to find that folder. So we were just there, and it was dataset preprocessing. Yeah, this is so not it wasn't quite what we wanted. Tools? Someone say tools. Uh, oh, train net pi sounds. Helpful, maybe. That's the training script. Is that not where not. we loaded the data? So the data will get data. loaded there, but we want to find where the data sets are defined. Oh. Yeah. Well, we were just there. <laughs> that wasn't right. But maybe there's so, maybe so this is, remember when I said you can kind of go down and then you step back up and then you can keep going back down. So there's probably another folder somewhere. Yeah, Melanie. Yeah, let's, we can check that. This one. Okay, is this with the one you said, Mel? Tests. Okay, so just a hint for you guys, a lot of these really nice, well-established code bases have what's called unit tests built into them. So that entire tests folder is just scripts that test this code and verify it's working as it should. Really nice, but you don't really need to worry about them. Okay. This is like how, what packages you need. Sorry, can you just say again what we're looking for? <laughs> you're, so you're looking for basically um, uh, a whole folder full of code yeah. where it's going to be defining like different input data sets. So one of them will be like a Coco, like the standard Coco data set. Another one might be something like LMS. Right. So would it be in configs or is that that's only for the models? But so this type of thing, this is exactly how I explore it. Like if I'm working with a new code base, I end up just clicking into so many folders. And right. like, no, this looks like something else. Okay, no, so yeah. I'll go back. Maybe it's in here. So yeah, I don't think this is it because this is like the info about the models. Um, so these are pre-processing scripts. So what that one is doing in particular is it's taking the Elvis data set and making it in the Cocoa format so they can use the same data loader. But not a bad thing to look at. Okay. So does it at the end like send it? No. All right. So what is, what is the point <laughs> we haven't gone into yet in that main folder? <laughs> yeah, the Tectron 2. Let's go. Okay. Ahead. Look, another <laughs> data folder inside a different uh, folder. Data set mapper? Maybe look in data sets. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Okay. Look at these. These look like names of data sets dot pi. <laughs> right. Okay. So we're assuming what format for our data? Code code. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is the thing that Benny was talking about. You have this thing that loads in your annotations. You have stuff later on in the code that will load in a single element of your data. And you can look at this, and this is basically that thing that's being called by default. If you just use that where you just register and you say, okay, here's my JSON, then this is like the default thing. And so this is where if you say have a Coco data set, but maybe you have one other thing in your data set, like maybe time of day, which is not something they have in Coco normally, you would need to adapt this file and add time of day in the dictionary so it would know to find that and that would be associated with your data input. And that would be in hit, like after one of these options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. where it's kind of reading all that, these different so um, I do that and stuff add. in, you would add in different types of um, okay. yeah, data. Okay, yay Peggy. Peggy, who's next? <laughs> Call someone out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> who's uh, Nat, I can see you at the back there. Have you done it already? Come on up. <laughs> All right, so yours is not maybe so hard, hopefully. Um, what input size does the model that we picked expect? So what like width times height of the model does that expect and can we change it? Okay. Um, you guys can help me because I'm not sure what to yeah, do. Yeah, it's supposed to be all them together. <laughs> So anyone remember where where those where the model was defined? Uh, when we talked about uh, mm -hmm, and then we found a, a specific type of file that was defining our model, right? Mm -hmm, the config. So is it in no? Yeah. So. Defaults or just con? So this is the file that defines how to read a config. Okay. So it's relevant. So it's defaults, maybe? Well, if you go in the main folder, there's another person. Yeah, and this uh, is what I was trying to get at with this thing is that sometimes this stuff is nested. There were two <laughs> data set folders. Oh, here. There are two different config folders. Um. So, or is Heike, it, do you remember where that YAML file you found was? <laughs> okay. Oh, so we want button and that this one? Yeah. But you'll notice this config doesn't have a lot of information in it. So, this is specifying the differences from maybe a standard config. So let's go see if we can find the root standard configs. Because there's not very much stuff to find in there. <laughs> is it the base? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Where, base yes. Exactly. So here is all the stuff that would define a model. So are this three? Sizes. So those are under anchor generator. So that's yeah. defining something about anchors. So it's, is it, what, what size are we? Input size. So we want to know basically what does it expect in terms of the image size that we send in? Because remember all of us for our custom data, we might have different image input sizes or might want to use bigger inputs for something. Anyone have any ideas? Yeah, that's yeah. that's really good. Looking for something that has a three in it is usually it's, a good call. Where? Yeah, but if but if you look, that's um that's basically uh that's under this thing that says anchor generator. It's staggered under it. 
Um, RetinaNet has something called anchor. And so that's defining the size of those anchors. Um, it's basically just a set of boxes that are in there to begin with, that then you, your model learns how to move those boxes to find stuff. So that those we probably don't want to touch for this model for now. So is it not in here? Is it in this? Another Maybe. architecture? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I get to? Um, is it even further back? Because these are not what we want. That's the one I just clicked on. Yeah. To like back? Oh. Going in here. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so height width. But where is yeah. this file? Speak up. Yeah. Or no, in here, in the main? No, in the main. Okay. Oh, I don't even see common. Yeah. So models and then yeah because it was just used right in that so mm -hmm. model what? yeah but input shape is In features, oh, here. Where's input? Oh, I'm sorry. This was not quite. This? Is it? Oh, wait. So maybe go. So we think it's not in here, maybe. So um, so Ben's gonna try and help you through it. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. So I tried to put in the scavenger hunt the list of things that you actually might want to see. And so this is kind of a list of like here's the stuff that you're going to want to try and figure out for any new project. And sometimes it can be tricky. So let's see. Yeah, here's the like standardized opening thing. They are sort of <laughs> not, always, not helping, <laughs> but actually, so there's, there's some variation, but sometimes you start to learn a little bit of like pattern. So one of the Sorry. Oh, sorry. In default, oh, like here, 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 defaults. Um. Yeah, look at that. Data sets. So up at the top it said input. That, that one of the first things it said. Scroll down a little. Input. Oh, input. Um, see, but these are. Is this the size of your images? This is. Yeah, the look. Size of... Look in line fifty-seven. The smallest side is going to be referring to the side, one of the sides of your image. So if you have tall, skinny images or wide, short images, the longest side or the smallest side. So it's telling you basically by default, this uses these, these defaults and then it will resize the shortest side. So it's doing automatic resizing of inputs. And so this is telling you what it expects from your inputs, which is like you should not have something smaller or bigger than this, and you might have to change these. 
Anyway, tricky one. Okay. Sounded simple, right? Actually, we're not there yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, from the main base folder. And then This is a really good trick. You can search within a repository. There's a search bar at the top of GitHub, and you can select whether you want to search in the repository you're currently in. So, Benny's going to help you out. Yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's give you the solution. The story is <laughs> you see, this is a very, very long code file. And that is because remember the talk, uh, the lecture yesterday, and the repo I gave you, we separated parameters from the code. And I told you, like, for example, you put the parameters into config files, into a config folder, and we put the implementation into a folder with the same name as your project. Well, let's check Detection again. Let's go through it carefully. Because we have here a folder called Detection 2, and we have been in this now. But if you go in here, this is actual implementation. And Detection is made by Facebook. I think you can trust these guys. So you can trust them that their implementation is correct. And again, you, that's why I told you separate parameters from and data from your code. You don't want to be modifying the code for something like the input size. The input image size is a hyperparameter. So where are you going to find hyperparameters? Not in a folder. Not in a folder because that's the code. <laughs> where where are you going to find where are you going to find hyperparameters like the input size? Configs, it's a configuration parameter. So let's go back into configs. <laughs> let's go, for example, to Cocoa Detection. We want to use RetinaNet, right? So we use the RetinaNet, the YAML file, the configuration file. Okay, there's not much in here, but you see this builds on top of base RetinaNet, which we had open before. And you see there is two dots and then a slash, which means parent directory. So we go back to the parent directory. We find the file base right in it, which actually is in, I think, the config itself here. And of course, you are there. These are all the parameters. And of course, there is a lot of parameters about other things than the size. For example, you see here, this is staggered, as Sarah said. This is all about the model. So when you see sizes here, that's part of the model. That's not part of the input. But if you go down here, there is a section called input. And there it says minimal size for tray. And what this means is that detection accepts, uh, RetinaNet accepts different sizes and detection will just resample to the closest. I was being mean. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I yeah, think, but someone was like, wait, but we're looking for a three, which is normally what you would look for. Okay. But RetinaNet accepts different sizes of input. Yeah. You, you could be like 640 by 1024. And when we were going in and we found those things that were, that were um, looking at resizing, there were those defaults. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to resize to one of these standard formats where one of your size, either your largest side or your smallest side are going to be uh, defined to be that. Um, but this type of stuff is details of a specific model and it will be different for every model. And these are one of the things that anytime you're trying to use a new model, I, I was trying to hammer home with, with this thing, you want to make sure you understand what the expectations of inputs are. Some models require fixed input and then it'll resize everything to that fixed input. Some models like RetinaNet or actually like faster RCNN can take different sizes of inputs going in. Here's another trick. Uh, if you want to be able to train in parallel, which means train on with every step, not just a single image at a time, there is no such thing as a code base that can handle variable input image sizes and have a batch of larger than one. And so usually what you'll do 
is you'll define for yourself, okay, no, I want to use a larger batch size. So then everything is going to get resized to the same input size for that batch. Anyway, that one was tricky. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Benny, do you want to? Uh, truth be told, I don't fully understand it either. No. <laughs> the story is, as Sarah just said, RetinaT is a model that can accept multiple different sized images. But what this means, some of these model data, you can't just say, if you can't put an image in with 800 pixels in width, then you cannot maybe put a picture in with 801 pixels because then it doesn't work anymore because of the way convolution layers work. And so what this means is these are acceptable widths of images that you can put in. And what I think what detection does is it just resizes the images to the closest. Mm -hmm. It's just a built-in functionality. Yeah. But, um, but what I would say here, you wouldn't really want to mess with the input sizes too much. And generally, you don't want to mess with the input sizes too much because if you change the input sizes a lot, those pre-trained image net weights that you'd like to use, those might get a little weird. Um, in some cases, it's just explicitly you can't use it anymore. For example, if you want to have not just red, green, blue, but you also want to have like a depth channel, then Sometimes in that case, then you really, you can't use a pre-trained model. You have to figure out some clever ways to try to add an additional input channel, but still load the model weights. Um, but for something like this, uh, I actually wouldn't mess with this. And I would just verify that if you send in your images, that something in this is going to resize it to the images that you expect, which is kind of where we we're going with Natalie. Anyway, I'm sorry. I know that this has been a little confusing. Um, feel free to like follow up with us. Let's move on really quickly just so we can get through this. Um, so uh, the next one is about pre-processing. Um, I'm going to skip that for now, but basically the point, um, I'm, I'm going to have you guys kind of, you can go through these yourself and try and find this stuff, or you can actually try and go through the same practice with whatever code you actually want to use. But pre-processing, the thing we really want to work for there is Sometimes there are hard coded normalization values in a pre processing uh, script that will basically assume that you're using ImageNet. Um, so it's basically these normalization values for red, green, and blue that they, that they build, they just average the entire training set for ImageNet and then build this normalization. But if your data set is an ImageNet, those values might be pretty wrong. Um, so sometimes you need to go in and verify and check what's going on with pre-processing, um, and if that's just default hard-coded in. And then also, if you change those normalization values, you also might have something where you need to train a little bit longer because that ImageNet pre-trained model is expecting those normalizations. OK, so uh, the next one, let's have um, Ethan. Do you want to come up and try one? Uh, you're going to look for uh, understanding for our RetinaNet model. So for the model we picked, or just for the code base in general, what data augmentation is it doing by default? So and data augmentation, we haven't talked about a bunch yet, and we're going to have a whole lecture on it next week. But that's things like trying to basically trick your model into thinking you have more data than you do. So a really simple one that's often used is you'll train on all of your input images, but then you'll also, at, when you're loading in your data, at random, you'll flip the image left to right. So now it has a different orientation of pixels, but it still has the same concept. So the matrix, matrix looks different, the concept is the same. And those random flips, even it's a really simple trick, but that can really help your model not overfit because it's getting more diverse examples. Another thing is like random cropping. So instead of sending in this whole matrix, you'll like randomly crop it a little and then resize it to the same size. And now again, you're just shifting the matrix values around in your sort of input image matrix to give it more diversity. There's a lot of tricks there. We just want to check what are the defaults. And the reason for this is for people like Anton, where they're doing individual re-identification, and it actually is invalid to take an animal, flip it, and call it the same animal because right and left sides are not identical. And so you want to be careful about the data augmentation to make sure it matches your task. Go ahead. Cool. Uh, oh, sorry, that's a oh yes. Cool. <laughs> All right. 
Hmm. So we're looking for the default augmentation. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be in hmm. code. Yes. Let's check out configs. Hmm. So, so, yeah. Yeah. And it's right. It's probably in the code because yes. the augmentation is going to happen in the code. Now, you might be able to specify what sense. you want, but if you don't specify anything, it's going to do something. So we're trying to figure out what's the default. Maybe you have to go all the way back to the original select base one and then go to the second one. Yeah. Nice. Where? Data. Yeah, transform sounds. Transform good. sounds, yeah. Oh. oh. <laughs> cool. So. so, this is a file that tells you all of the built in options for data augmentation in this code base. So, this is super useful. Because if you want to use any of this stuff, you can. But now we want to figure out what the defaults are. And so how would we maybe find the default in this code? It, it might be in here. So scroll down. Remember how when we define, remember how when we define a class, we define there are sometimes like default values in the class? Ooh, yeah. Is that is there oh yeah, there is this augmentation class. All right, let's see. Doesn't say it in the doc string. So um, I think that they would probably be, um, for example, uh, probabilities or maybe like a list of names of things that look like flip left, right, that type of thing. So remember, you can also search in the search bar. So you could also maybe search something like flip, since you know flip is a pretty common augmentation. Okay. Um, so and actually here, what, what you can do is you can go up to the very top to the GitHub search bar, uh, and you can okay. search in repository. Gotcha. Is there? Did I just? Yep. And then in this. Okay, but that actually sounds like it could be a nice test. That time. sounds like a good call, right? If there's a tutorial around augmentation, that might show us where to look. Oh, test time augmentation. Uh, detection. Say it again. Oh, okay. But yeah, ben, Benny's point is right, and I think Brian is really on point here, which is. Sometimes it's much faster if you have well documented code to look in the documentation for tutorials. Yeah. Back up. Back up. Ah. Nice. Let's see. Awesome. Nice. So this is basically showing you basic usage. Um, so how you would use the data augmentations that are there. Um, it allows you to, it tells you how you can write new augmentations, which is cool. Um, but it's still not giving us the default. default it is, yeah. Hmm. Um, so maybe we want to go um, and what we probably want to find is something that looks like maybe preprocessor.py. Hmm. Something that's like okay. telling us how the data is preprocessed. Hmm. Maybe like yeah. Um, and so sometimes actually what I think what you can do is you can go into that trainnet.py file, that training file. And see how think where things get called, and then start following that thread as a way to try to figure out where something might happen. Gotcha. So that was in. That? I think maybe it's in tools in this code base. Okay. If I remember, yeah. Which is a little confusing because I would have think that tools would be something else. But okay, so this is your default standard training script. This is like 
what you would call if you want to train something. Mm. So now let's see, scroll down. Trainer. So it builds your evaluator. So now let's try and find, let's just, so I, I'll just start going through this. So okay. build Sweet. evaluator. So click that. Nice. And go to where it's defined. That takes you to the definition. So you can click on it and it'll just take you there. Oh, okay. Nice, right? Um, no, try and click it again. I don't think it takes me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now it's um, looking for these different evaluation types. So that doesn't actually look right because that's telling us something about the different data sets. Yeah. Um, and how you might evaluate those data sets. We want to figure out how that, when we actually load in data, like where that stuff is. Um, hmm. So do you want me to try and do this? I actually don't know where this is defined in this file. Oh, so okay. uh, you can watch me suck at this too. Um, cool. So we looked at data sets originally. This pre-processing stuff, these data augmentations are probably happening in the code. Um, so we looked at data and common these are shared iterators data loaders so this is like a bunch of common code that's trying to um, do things like load batches of images but let's see this has something called a map function so maybe we'll go to data set mapper ah augmentations oh. okay cool that's good so when you're building, when you're initializing this data set mapper, it's going to take in a list of augmentations. Um, so data set mapper, I'm going to see now like where data set, where this class data set mapper gets called in the code. Okay. So it looks like it gets called, uh, there's this thing called data loading.md and dot .md is a, usually a documentation file. Yeah, you, okay. no, you gotta stay up here with me. Okay. Be my moral yeah. support. <laughs> okay, so this is a custom data loader. Okay, look here. Here's some things like this is the default data set mapper. You might need to write a custom mapper, but in this default data set mapper, um, it looks like here it says it defines these different augmentations. And so now we're just still trying to figure out what's by default default trainer maybe might tell us nope that's a broken link bad job detection detectron uh oh lost all my stuff all right detectron 2 you you have any tips benny do you know where the defaults are defined in here yeah mm -hmm. but we want to know where they're defined so that might be in the convicts? Yeah, I thought I saw something about horizontal oh, hey. annotations in like one of the config files. OK, I mean, maybe this one? Yeah, no, it was like one of the, I feel like it was one of the longer ones. OK. Um, I thought I saw it in. Common, maybe. Yeah, I thought it was. In... Data, that's probably. Mm, no, I think it was in the models okay ah no it wasn't here this is not it where was it mm. but yeah yeah it's like we're trying to figure out for this model we're using what is it going to do <laughs> oh wait what so i think this outside config right oh okay because yeah. the, the this is yeah the config that's inside there is defining how the config gets used gotcha. configs common, common data, data cocoa, pie. cocoa pie this is where we just were oh look Oh. Sometimes when yes. we try and read a file, we don't read carefully and we skip stuff. Okay, awesome. So what, is, what does it look like the def defaults are? 
Yep, it's using a random oh, clip yeah. and it's also resizing the shortest edge. Hey, remember that list of the default image sizes? It's based, it's using the shortest edge and it's resizing that shortest edge to one of these default standard sizes. Well, resizing is kind of an augmentation-ish because if you resize to different sizes, that can be an augmentation, but it's also just pre-processing. It is a particular augmentation because to check the second argument in that resize sort of shortest edge. What does it say? Sample style. In, in resize sort shortest edge, the second argument after short edge length choice, it randomly chooses. Oh, so there we have your answer. So it's basically what it's doing is it's taking your image and then it's randomly resizing it to these different sizes. And again, that actually, that random resizing is also changing that matrix. So if you're randomly resizing to smaller, it's like compressing the image in a way. Yeah. Okay. Is there a difference okay. between like just like resizing an image in this sense versus like resampling something when you're like, reprojecting a, a raster or something like that? Like no, like so a, a reprojection of a raster would be another example of like some pre-processing that you're yeah. doing to the image. And then if if for example, at training time, if you randomly change the way you do that, then that could be considered an augmentation because you're basically taking for a single input input image, you're giving your model different, like you'll, you'll get for one input image, like a bunch of different um, variability. I, I guess, yeah, I guess I'm just like thinking about, like there are a bunch of different methods to like resample, like yes. nearest neighbor averaging mm -hmm. or things like that. So is there only one way that this works? To resize an image or so if you go into that resize shortest edge transform i bet it has something by default oh, okay. but actually it might also have other stuff already implemented mm -hmm. so i mean i know i know um for some code bases you can actually specify using a, a variable what resizing you want to do okay by linear interpolation just like max value Let's check. you want to oh, check let's okay. go in there okay <laughs> so couldn't find it, but check the T. What is this? It's T is Detectron 2 data transforms. So Detectron 2, and it's Detectron 2 data transforms. Augmentation.py, transform.py, transform.py. OK. Here's a resize transform. And here, interpolation equals none is the default. So by default, it has now it allows you to use any of the PIL, which yeah. is a type of image, any of their type of interpolation methods. Okay. And, and by default, it does by linear. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah. So that's the nice stuff about this code base is all this stuff's built in, but you have to be able to find it. Okay. One more person. Maybe they'll do one more of these and let's go to lunch. Um, so uh let's go with the simplest thing how would we launch training um so we've kind of actually seen it in different ways so far but um does anyone want to be a brave volunteer to go through how we launch training how about justin come down here and figure out how we'd launch training <laughs> I mean, you saw how hard it was for me to figure out what it was. It's like exactly what we do. But was it okay. cell organized? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, this is like <laughs> one of the nicest code bases out there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when I said this is why you don't want to use code that like isn't well vetted? Yeah. It's because this stuff can get really nasty really fast. So is this also like a whole thing that's not built into the like, Yeah. Or this is built into the No. It's not. Okay. So all this stuff is using Pyperse. This is all like extra yeah. on top of Pyperse. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So this action is really optimized for computers. So for example, it assumes every image is already there, all this kind of stuff. And it does a lot of stuff. It does detection, segmentation, interpretation, etc. Which is why it can be a bit overwhelming. It has so much built in that they try their best way to organize things properly, but that it can be difficult. But if you dig down, as you can see, you will find it. And also, it gives you all that stuff standardized. So if you, for example, set up your code to load in your data here and to be able to train models, and you are training it with the ResNet 50 backbone, and you want to try 
uh, you know, like a visual transformer bar with some other backbone, then that's literally something you can just swap out something in your config and you'll train a whole new model. And you don't have to change anything about your data. You don't have to change anything about your evaluation. So like it gives you then this ability to basically try everything in there with very minimal code once you get it going, which is pretty powerful. Yeah. And so like also because there's 22,000 stars of this, you assume that they've built it so that other people can like easily start it up and run it. And like you've already seen all these different config files that kind of hold all the custom settings for each different model. So you know that you're probably not going to need to like write a bunch of custom code. Um, so the first thing I would do is just check the, the readme to see if there's some training documentation because probably they they've um, they have like a nice easy training script that you should be able to use. They have a good training like block of code in the tutorial. Uh -huh. So I'm not sure if you want to Well we could look at the tutorial and try and figure out what we need to change. Yeah. So it's go to the go to the app, go to the control app notebook, and get me started. Okay. And then like that frame model in the tutorial. Uh oh. Okay. Train exclamation point. <laughs> that looks like a good start. I really hope that that was like an intern put that exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God we're there. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like they are defining a custom configuration. They're adding the name of their data set to the training uh, data set list. They're gonna have some kind of balloon data set. Um, they define the number of classes. So these are kind of like the custom things that you would have to do for your data set. Like you change the number of classes, tell it where the, um, the YAML file is that you want to use, tell it where the... So, so what you've got here is you have a script where basically um, instead of writing a new YAML file, like just editing a YAML file directly, they're reading in that one, that Cocoa instance segmentation mask, and then all these things where then they say CFG dot. So that's now, CFG is now a config class and they're overwriting things from the standard YAML to use their stuff. You can do it this way. They're doing it this way so that they can run it in Colab easily. But if we were gonna run it outside of Colab, like run from the command line, you would probably just write your own YAML file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then you can just point to it. Um, yeah, I was gonna see if there's actually, like, can we just run this? Like if we import the get config, uh oh. <laughs> if we run this import config, oh, oh maybe yeah, like import it's not probably yeah, not worth exactly. doing right now. But um, so I think this is super. This is nice because it's showing you like the code that would need to be called to run trainer dot train. Um, but actually, they also in the documentation they had command line examples. So we'd probably want to run from the command line because we're going to be running this on our VM, not necessarily in a Colab notebook, and our VM is where our data is mounted. So you probably want to look for not Colab style launch training, but um, command line launch training. So I'm maybe just go to the back to the top, the root documentation. Okay. Oh, you mean this documentation? Yeah. Okay. So training. So similarly here, they're kind of telling you how to do custom stuff. Um, We're just getting started. Training and evaluation on the command line. That seems helpful. Yeah. So it looks like inside the tools directory, there's a train net.py. And then you can specify configuration options just with these command line arguments, like number of GPUs, tell it where the config file is. Um, images per batch. So Benny talked about this yesterday, like changing your batch size. Um, you can modify the learning rate. 
So here, what they're doing, remember how in that collab, they had all those um, parameters that they were overwriting in the class? It looks like they've actually set up their trainer.py file so that you can define changes to a config on the command line as well. So you can point to that raw config and you can overwrite things on the command line. This is helpful for param hyperparameter tuning stuff. So if you guys make one default config, that's the config that's roughly going to be used for all your stuff. But then you say like, uh, sometimes I want to randomly flip and sometimes I don't just to see, then you could have that same default config. And then you could run an experiment where you've just changed that one parameter from the command line. That's cool. Now, if you want to try like four different ones, now you can write something where it will just launch four different scripts. So you can do them in different like things. So you can change a little bit of stuff and run it. But I would be slightly cautious. And I think that this code base is good, but you want to check this. When you start training, hopefully you want to check, it should save a version of the config for that experiment in the, in the folder where it's going to put all the results. Because I have run into this before. If you don't do that, if you don't have, this was the config for this file with all of the parameters that are used, then you can very easily end up in a place where you're trying to keep track of a bunch of different folders of output models and you don't remember which model had which parameters. So usually these code bases, because they're kind of built, doing a lot of this for you, they'll automatically save the entire fleshed out config and they merge all that stuff. So it's like the base config with all the stuff you added, it'll have all of that in one file that it saves. If you're not using one of these standardized things, you're, like if you're just doing classification, you're gonna wanna make sure that you add that for yourself. Add in this thing that saves the config or saves whatever your parameters are to the model file so you don't lose track. And then one other thing, if, if the repository has like a training script with these kind of command line arguments, usually from the command line, you can just run like python train net.py dash h and it will show you all the different um, like command line arguments that you could pass into this thing if you want to know like you know what's the command for uh, changing the batch size and changing the image resolution and things like that cool all right guys this was i think a bit overwhelming Very helpful. okay i hope it was helpful um i would love you know let's all go to lunch <laughs> we'll come back after lunch um right after lunch at our reading groups um so we'll thank him for that and then we have a bit of work time and you know, I think today would be really awesome if all of you can at least say, like, this is the code base I think I'm going to use. And that can be Benny's classification example, and you're going to kind of adapt from there. Or it can be, I'm going to train detection, and I want to use the standard YOLO v5 code base, or this detectron code base, or I'm going to do segmentation, I'm going to use whatever. But just get a sense for yourself and check with your instructor about your plan of, like, where are you going to start? Um, and, like, how are you going to adapt this stuff? Anyway, you guys are all awesome. Um, don't get overwhelmed. If this was super overwhelming, remember that, you know, I actually on purpose, I was like, I'm going to make sure like, I don't know where all these things are. So like, I have to go find them too. And uh, it's a good reminder that like, you kind of learn stuff, but sometimes it just takes some poking around and just be patient. Um, yay. Okay. <laughs>